All right, why don't you go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, as we go back to when COVID first began and we were in the midst of a series called Reading Romans Backwards, which was based on Scott McKnight's book by the same title. And we stopped because we we're going to be going more video format for a while. And we wanted to make it a little bit lighter uh, for those that would be watching from home because it's a little more difficult to really be attentive uh, and to follow all of this and that. But, you know, uh, we thought that this COVID thing might last for a few months. Uh, it has lasted a lot longer than that. And so uh, we're going back. We're going back to reading Romans backwards. We've probably got about five uh, weeks, five messages left in the series. And so today we're going to uh, continue in Romans 3, verses 26 to 31, or 27 to 31. And we are uh, doing a message called The Path of Descent. Uh, just a little bit of background information to kind of refresh your memory. Uh, we looked at and began with chapters 12 through 16, hence reading Romans backwards. Chapters 12 through 16, we said, was a living theology. Uh, it was really the crux, the core of the book of Romans. And sometimes when we start at the beginning, uh, chapters 1 through 11, which are really more supporting points for the major theme that comes in verses or chapters 12 through 16, uh, we end up getting into so much detail in the first chapters that we miss the larger point of how to live out our faith in chapters 12 through 16. So we've been through chapters 12 through 16. We've gone back and done a lot of the earlier chapters of 1 through 11, the supporting points. We remember that there are two different groups that Paul is addressing. He's speaking to the church in Rome, and there are two groups. There is the weak. Now, these are Jewish believers are called the weak, and they're only called the weak because uh, their, their sensitivities to things like uh, eating non-kosher food and those kinds of things. And because they're centered in Rome, where they actually have less of a voice and they have uh, less of an influence than the Roman Christians do. If this were in Jerusalem, that would probably be different, but they're in Rome. And so the Roman Christians seem to have more power and, and, and more influence than the Jewish believers. And then there's the strong. That's the Gentile or Roman believers, and that they are considered strong not because they have such great faith, uh, but because they have the influence and the power here, and both of them will be challenged in order to lay down that power and see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, in chapter 1, just to lay the foundation for chapter 3, uh, we, chapter 1 talks about the predicament of the Gentiles who had made gods after their own image. And then chapter 2 to chapter 3, the Jewish people, we discover are, are kind of in the same boat. The law that they trusted so much in didn't actually vindicate them. It indicted them. It wasn't meant to make them righteous. It was meant to make them aware of their brokenness, of the inability to live up to God's law, God's standard. And they certainly did fail to live up to its requirements. So in conclusion, we said all of humanity is in need of a savior. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, is how Paul puts it. Last, we talked about in the last message before we took a temporary leave from this series, that message was called the disintegration of humanity. And we were left with nothing to do but reflect on our own brokenness, the natural consequences of our own actions. The Jewish Christians had had a difficult time with this concept. After all, they were God's chosen people, were they not? They had followed God's divine law, the Torah that was entrusted to them. And then um, the Gentiles, on the other hand, uh, to have them have some sort of equal status to them was kind of insulting. They felt that it somehow devalued them as a people. They failed to recognize their own superior status. Ironically, this is how the Roman Gentiles felt Two. So here we have two groups that both tend to feel superior to each other. And you can't imagine what examples there might be of that kind of thing going on in contemporary culture, can you? Maybe try to brainstorm for a while. Now, in the verses just previous to this, Paul made a great truth statement. He said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so that's what I kind of want to keep in the background of your mind as we now enter into verses 27 to 32 of chapter 3. 
There it says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, the Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold it. Now, the setting is Rome. A number of the house churches that existed there uh, were made up of both Jew and Gentile until the emperor decided to exile the Jewish people out of Rome and with them, the Jewish Christians. But upon some of those Jewish Christians' return, coming back, they found that these house churches were obviously now mainly Gentile in origin. That was the majority. And the Gentiles really did seem to claim primacy. One, because they're Roman citizens and they're in Rome, but also because they are in majority and have been leading the house churches since the Jewish Christians have been away. Now, the Jewish believers believe that they have the right to reclaim primacy because, hey, after all, they are God's chosen people. Jesus was Jewish and faith came through them. But also before that was the law and the law or the Torah was entrusted to them. Now, Paul comes along and he levels the playing ground. This isn't about who's better or wiser or preferred by God, Paul says. Following the path of Jesus isn't a path to ascension in the world. In fact, it begins with the path of descent. Before Christ ascended from the dead, he first underwent three levels of descent from heaven to earth, from earth to the grave, and from the grave he descended into hell. Right? We have a wonderful song about that. Now, the Jews and the Gentiles had gotten into a comparison game. Now, the first point is that comparison leads to false pride. Comparison leads to false pride. Verse 27, Paul asks, where then is boasting? It is excluded. There's no room for boasting for those who become followers of Christ because it's not that kind of faith. It's not that kind of religion. It's not that kind of status. If there is anything about our faith or our beliefs or our practices that makes us feel superior to others, well, or leads us to feel more entitled, we have fallen into the ancient sin of elitism. Some believe that this was really Satan's undoing, the sin of pride. Now, it's not something unique to any one people group. In this passage, Paul confronts the Jewish believers, but in other places in the same book, he confronts the Roman believers. Because in Rome, they were considering themselves to be privileged even over the Jewish folks. Now, Scott McKnight describes it like this as we try to understand what a shift this would have been for the Roman believers. He says, in Rome, boasting was common and expected. How so? The Roman male of privilege and status was expected to pursue the cursus honorum, the life path toward public honor. And it was the path for those who had power and who were of noble birth or who had beautiful or swift bodies, or who were generous with their wealth, or courageous in battle, or capacious in public speaking. The path to honor was competitive to the core, and what one had accomplished on the path, marked by public appointments to public offices, required boasting. Uh, the emperor would boast about his achievements. Uh, it was actually, you were actually taught, if you were on the up and up, to be able to know how to boast about those who are ahead of you in order to gain status for yourself. You were to say certain things about your leaders so that they could feel like they had prominence in your, and that you hoped that you would rise to more provident, prominence because of it. Now, the Romans were taught and expected to boast in their positions whether by honors that they had earned or if they didn't have those honors, by mere uh, position of their citizenship as Roman citizens, which made them better than everyone else in the world that wasn't a Roman citizen. 
Now, Jewish people have been taught not to boast, but I mean, how could they not, right? After all, they're God's chosen people out of all the nations. And so they become rather prideful or boastful as well. Now, this competition of comparison of personal status led these two groups into rivalry with one another. And by worldly standards, both actually had pretty good arguments. But within the realm of spirituality, they were missing an important truth. Their state was one of fallenness. Self-exaltation was only further blinding them to the truth that Christ had come to reveal and ultimately to redeem. Both groups had chosen the path towards self-ascension, but Jesus, who calls us to follow him, which means follow in his way, chose the path of descent, teaching us that genuine faith leads to humility. Jewish believers felt like they had a moral edge. They had the law, after all. They knew the difference between right and wrong, and Gentiles for hundreds and thousands of years really did not, and they lived lives proving that. Paul tells the Jewish folks, the Jewish believers, that they really misunderstood the law and its intent. It wasn't created or intended to make you righteous before God. It was there to awaken you to the fact that something is deeply wrong that there's a brokenness. It was meant to lead you toward looking to God for our redemption, for the redemption of all humanity. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they have a tradition that has been going on for a long time of awarding medallions given for depending on how long you've been sober. So your first medallion may come 30 days in and you've got your 30 day medallion and then each month after that, and then you'll go by based on years. And and these medallions are really important because it measures the success or it measures the length where you've been able to stay free, where you've been able to stay clean. It's definitely something to be celebrated, but it's never something to get arrogant or prideful about. So rather than feeling superior to someone else who doesn't have a chip that is uh, marking a status of sobriety for as long as you, you become an encourager. You become a supporter. You become a mentor to those who have less time in sobriety than you because you know what it's like to struggle. You want nothing more than to maintain your own freedom while seeking to foster freedom in others like yourself. So there's room for celebrating, but there's no room for boasting. So there's a need to recognize that your success is built on grace, never self-exaltation. Why? Because pride cometh before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. And so our path to recovery begins not with status, but with what? Confession, right? Confession. It's a key central element in Christianity. It's really where we begin. And so in AA, the first step is we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Did you know that AA is built on Christian principles? So we might rephrase this because maybe alcohol isn't your thing, but you got some things. We might rephrase it as We admitted that we were powerless over sin, in other words, dysfunction, that our lives had become unmanageable. Many mistakenly made the Christian faith into some sort of self-promotion, not increasing in humility, but rather in self-exaltation, if you can believe it, and it still happens today, which is exactly the opposite of Christ's example, who rather than becoming more, chose to become less for the sake of the other, for the sake of us. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 talks about this. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, that means held on to, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, death on a cross was the most humiliating way to die in the first century. 
Jesus introduced humanity to what the Franciscans have come to call the path of descent, or also known as the way of the cross. It's a path downward, and the path downward is more trustworthy than any path upward. The path upward only tends to feed the ego. As one Franciscan friar puts it, he says, True liberation is letting go of our false self, letting go of our cultural biases, and letting go of our fears of loss, letting go of our need to control and manipulate God and others. It is even letting go of our need to know and our need to be right. We become free as we let go in three primary areas, our need for power and control, our need for safety and security, and our need for affection and esteem. So we let go of comparison and competition when we embraced following Christ. We embrace camaraderie and compassion instead. After all, there is only one God. Verse 29 and 30, is God the God of the Jews only? Paul asks, is he not the God of the Gentiles too? And in case you weren't sure, yes, of the Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. To believe in one God is to believe in one humanity. God is the God of all because there's only one God that by default makes him the God of all. Therefore, there is no room for competition and comparison. There is only one hope, a hope for redemption, one for all. The second step of AA says this, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I don't know what you're putting your hope in today that might restore us to sanity, but if it's not the one power, the one true God revealed in Jesus Christ, then you're facing your your hope in a false God, in a false trust. You see, The powers and principalities of this world invite you toward the path of ascension, which is really another way of saying self-exaltation, because if it's not the path of following Christ, but it promises that you'll ascend anyway, then it's the path of self-exaltation. And it's always marked by competition and comparison. That's why when the two disciples said to Jesus, Can't we sit on, tell us that we can be granted to sit on your left and your right hand when you come in to the kingdom. And the other disciples were jealous and upset with them. And Jesus is like, you don't understand what you're asking. And who ends up on Jesus's left and his right when he comes into the kingdom? Well, his exaltation happened on a cross and there was another crucified man on each side of him. So the disciples didn't understand that the way up in Christianity and following Christ is first the way down, the path of descent. The path of descent is the recognition of our common predicament, our common humanity, and it leads to humility, not pride over others. That together we might look up toward the only one who's greater than anyone else, the one true God, who himself in Christ descended He became like us so that together we might become like Christ. There is no individualistic ascension. Scripture says in Ephesians 4, 8 and 9, when it says he ascended, what does it mean that, but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, He made captivity itself a captive. Why? Because he's the one who sets the captives free. Who are the captives? All of us, right? Not just that guy over there or that guy over there who doesn't do it the way you do it or doesn't think the way you think or believe the way you believe. That's the whole thing. We start with the confession that I am among the captives. And he sets the captives free by breaking down the walls of hostility that separate us and uniting us as one in Christ. Not based on one opinion, but based on one work of Jesus Christ on the cross on behalf of humanity. 
John 15, 13 says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. The path of descent, not self-exaltation, not comparison and competition, but that we might be like Christ and lay down our lives for one another. There is only one God, and so then there is only one people, one humanity. Anything contrary to this comes from the evil one who has come to kill, steal, and destroy, and he does that through division. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks, and we do pray for unity, that we might first and foremost not align ourselves with any one group, but that we might align ourselves with the one humanity whose redemption Christ has secured through his self-sacrifice, his own descent upon the cross, lifted up so that he might descend into the grave and into hell itself, but only so that he could ascend again, leading captives free. We recognize that we are among those captives and that liberation isn't a reason to be prideful but a reason to seek the liberation of all of our fellow brothers and sisters of the human race, that we might know that we are one in this together, and that in Christ we might become one, not of the same opinion on every matter, but of the same one who redeems us all through his work, through the cross, and his spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, make us true followers. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you.